I don't know why it's doing that, so I'm going to have to work on it. That's not usually how it is. Usually it's landscape. Mm -hmm. Oh well, we'll go from there. So it is in a different format tonight. Having issues with my Facebook Live. Maybe I need to try my computer sometime. So I've been doing it this way for how many years now? Two years. So it must be a setting on my phone. Which I don't think I let the grandkids play with my phone last weekend. I don't think oh, so. I did, but they wouldn't have been able to change anything. I wouldn't think, but you so. never know. All right. <clears throat> my mom's on. We're going to finish up. John and Catherine are on. Barb's on. Mm -hmm. I don't... I don't like doing the portrait view. We'll have to work on it. I have to work on it. I should have worked on it today, actually. Had some time. Oh, well. Doesn't matter. Pam says, sorry for, about the technical difficulties. Maybe you could take a class on this. I'm not the one. <clears throat> well, it's beautiful weather here. I think it does affect everybody's attitudes. Don't you guys? Of course, it's relative. I mean, some people like cold weather, but... On the whole, most people like the warmer weather like we're seeing, 60s and 70s. Even people that live in like Portland where you have a lot more rain, they have more depression. Mm -hmm. Sunshine is good. States that are cloudy a lot and it rains a lot, they uh, suffer from more uh, depression. So anyway, we could ask our counselor. <laughs> All right, well... Grab your Bibles. Hope you're enjoying the weather. Tomorrow it's supposed to be what? 66. Here, 66 here. Good. I think we're uh, headed to spring-like weather now. Don't you? Mm -hmm. How many think we're going to get one more big snow, though? I hope not. Hi, Cheryl. Larry, possibly. I don't know. How's Springfield? What Springfield get up to today? Probably 70. Gloria is on. Gloria and uh, <clears throat> Tom, possibly. All right, well, we're going to finish up Romans 11. And uh, I always like reiterating the, the purpose of why Paul wrote the letter. So just like you, you're not just going to sit down. If you wrote a letter to somebody, we don't write letters, like sit down and write it out. Let's say an email. You know, how many of you still send out Christmas letters, Christmas emails? You write up a story about how your family's been doing um, over the last year, right? Maybe you have a new dog or a new job and you let them know how you're doing or you've been sick and you're letting people know that we're doing better, X, Y, and Z. Same way with the letters of the New Testament. The book of Philippians. I do a church service at a, an assisted living place and uh, we're going through Philippians and I love reiterating the theme of Philippians. It's a very positive letter. Paul's in prison. Uh, he's heard that there's a little disunity in Philippi, and he wants to wants that congregation to keep the gospel in focus, to have unity for the sake of advancing the gospel. And Galatians, the ladies at our church are going through Galatians. Uh, I could put Pammy on the spot and say, kind of, why did Paul write Galatians like? Was it, like in a nutshell. Because the Judaizers were trying to put the Mosaic law on the new Gentile believers so that they, telling them they need to be circumcised and obey the food laws. And Paul was highly upset. Now, when you compare Galatians with Philippians, do you get a different feel? Definitely. Different tone, different occasions, right? Just. Paul didn't just sit down and say, mm, let's see, what can I think about to write? They were occasional letters. Church of Corinth, they had asked Paul questions, so he writes answering their questions, and then he knows some issues that are going on at the church in Corinth. And as you read the letter, you can discern 
what the problem was, what, what were some of the problems at the church at Corinth. So, right? Mm -hmm. With, I'm going through Hebrews, almost finished with Hebrews. Coming up Easter, we will finish Hebrews. Hopefully, some folks on tonight that have been going through Hebrews with us could actually tell me or tell others why did the writer of Hebrews, what was his purpose? Just give him a little history lesson of the Old Testament. No. Okay? So it had an occasion, which we could get into. The occasion, it's amazing because people can preach all the way through Romans and not even bring up the occasion. And therefore, when they're preaching it, it's just these little doctrinal points or little topics that they want to hit on without showing how it relates to the whole of the book. Like, why did Paul write this here? What was the problem? So the first three chapters, let's just reiterate. It ties into our theme, okay, tonight, and I'll show you how. First three chapters, universally, no, I don't have any notes here. I'm just saying, I've been through Romans so many times that it gets ingrained in your head, and uh, you just, like, even if I close my Bible, I know what the first three chapters are, and you do too. Mm -hmm. We have a universal problem. So if, if Jews and Gentile believers aren't getting along in Rome, the church at Rome, let's show how they are all universally condemned. We're going to see that tonight in our text. God shuts up everyone in disobedience, right? So if you're in, keep your cha uh, finger in chapter 1 of Romans. Look over in chapter 11. For God has shut up all in disobedience, verse 32, so that he might show mercy to all. Right? That's what we've been talking about in, in chapter 11. Is God finished with the Jews? No. And he gives all these reasons. And Gentiles, you shouldn't be arrogant. Uh, God's not finished with the Jewish people. They're, they're just because many are rejecting the gospel. That's chapters 9, 10, and 11. And to show you this idea of he, he does it even again here in verse 32. God has shut up all under disobedience that he might have mercy on all. I think he's talking about all, meaning Jews and the rest of the nations. So in chapters 1, 2, and 3, he shows that we're all in need of forgiveness because we all are under the wrath of God. Chapter 1, verse 15 and 16, that's why we need the gospel, right? So in chapter 1, um, verse 14, Paul's un under uh, obligation to everyone, uh, to preach the gospel. He's not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes. And then he gets into the reason why. Because verse 18, the wrath of God is being revealed against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. And he shows how God has made himself known through creation. Chapter 2, he gets into the Jews. You aren't any better. You who say you should not steal, do you steal? And so chapter 2 is bringing in the Jewish people. They're not living according to the law. The law points out that they're sinners. Uh, chapter uh, 2, 21 and following talks about um, conviction to the Jewish people, that they're sinners in need of forgiveness. Here's a summary statement of the first three chapters. Verse 9 of chapter 3. What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have already charged... That both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. And then he speaks of all these Old Testament references showing the universality of, of, of sin. There's none righteous, not even one, that type of thing. Um, no one can be justified by works of the law, chapter 3, uh, verse 20. Why is that? Because the law only points out your sin. You can't be justified by the law because it, it, it points out your failures, your sin. So Paul's already charged in the first three chapters that everybody universally is under sin. Chapter 3 gives us, and how do we get this righteousness? It's by faith in Jesus. Verse 24, being justified as a gift through the redemption which is in Jesus. Verse 26, that God might be, what? The just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. The reason is, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, 323. The only way to stand justified is by faith in Christ. So now he, he says it's for everyone. There's no distinction. All those who have faith in Jesus, is God the God of the Jews? Not just the Jews only. He saves Jewish people by faith in Jesus, and he sa saves the rest of the nations when people 
repent, and trust in Jesus by faith, they're justified. Chapter 4, he says, I can show you that in the Old Testament people were justified by faith. Abraham and David, God justifies the ungodly, meaning you bring nothing to the table to justify you. God justifies the ungodly. And then you're declared righteous. Chapter 5, verse 1, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Chapter 6, well, if that's true, if you're saved by grace, I guess you believe you can live a life of sin. And Paul's like, absolutely not. Absolutely not. So he answers that in chapter 6. We were slaves of sin, now we're slaves of righteousness. Chapter 7, we're not married to the law anymore. We died. That husband died. We've now been married to Christ, and because we're in Christ, we can now bear fruit to God. So he gets into the law issue of chapter 7. Chapter 8, what does he do in chapter 8? There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And he paints a picture of those who don't have the Spirit with those who have the Spirit. If you don't have the Spirit, if you're not born again, you don't have the Spirit of God, you can't please God. That's what he says. Because your mind's set on the flesh. You're not even able, verse 8, 8, 8. Look at verse 8, 8. Those who are in the flesh can't please God. However, you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he doesn't even belong to him. Now, because of the Spirit, we can put to death sin. We have the power now to recognize sin and to kill it. That's chapter 6 and chapter 8. Verse, chapter 8, verse 13. If by the Spirit you're putting to death the deeds of the body. Chapter 9, man, what about has God failed? Paul says, no. I, I mean, I wish I could be a curse. So now chapters 9, 10, and 11, which we've been in for some time, what about the Jewish people? How come there are so many of them not believing in Jesus as the Messiah? And Paul says, man, I wish I could be a curse and for the sake of them and take their place. That can't happen. But God's word hasn't failed. Where do we see that at? Chapter 9, verse 6. And he says, just because you're an Israelite doesn't mean you're part automatically the people of God. And he gets into the doctrine of election. So in chapter 9, he shows that God is calling people from the Jews and the Gentiles, 924. You can't be saved by your own righteousness. So Jews, if you're trying to do that, Messiah is the only answer. Chapter 10, he says, My heart's desire and prayer for them is for their salvation. They have a zeal for God. But if it's not based on righteousness in Jesus, Jesus is the end of the law for righteousness for, to everyone who believes. Chapter 10, verse 4. There's no distinction, chapter 10, verse 12, between a Jew and a Greek. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So he, back and forth. Chapter 11, God has not rejected the Israelites, has he? May it never be. I'm an Israelite, Paul says. And then he gets into the issue of what's going on with Israel. And we saw in chapter 9, verse, uh, chapter 11, verse 25, there's a mystery. And part of this mystery is so that they wouldn't be arrogant. Paul's, Paul's saying like, you Gentiles, let me, let me warn you about arrogance. Like saying God's finished with the Jewish people says there's a partial hardening happening right now until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. Now, when you follow all of this, by the way, this idea that they're enemies, so Jewish people who reject Jesus, if you stumble over that, according to the gospel, they're enemies, well, we were once enemies. If you forget, I'll remind you, what chapter in, the, in Romans did it say we're, we were enemies before we were in Christ? So some people might stumble from the standpoint of the gospel, they're enemies. That is because if you're not reconciled to Jesus, you stand as an enemy. Because your sins, or you're carrying your sins. And they will exp you will experience the wrath of God because of them, them. But God has an elect that he's bringing to himself. And we saw this wild verse last week that somehow all Israel is going to be saved when the deliverer comes. So when were we enemies, Pam? Well, chapter 5, right? Let's go back to chapter 5 for a second. We were born, alienated, 
then we willfully sin ourselves and rebel. Chapter 5, verse 10, for while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Justified, declared righteous by the blood of Christ, his atoning death. I am no longer an enemy, but I'm reconciled. I have peace with God, 5.1. Folks, read through Romans one more time before we finish this great book, and you will see this theme all the way through Romans. And it and we're going to get into chapter twelve next week. Then he's now he's laid the found, theological foundation for them to get along. That's going to be chapter 12, 13, 14, and fifteen. How do we now act this out? So we were enemies too. You have friends and relatives, if they're not converted yet, they're still an enemy of God, meaning if they die, they're not entering God's presence because the wrath of God abides on them. That's why they need to be, quote, saved. They need delivered from that wrath. We are saved, what does that mean? From the wrath of God. Aren't you glad you're saved from the wrath of God? You're no longer an enemy? How did he do that? Through the bloody death of Jesus. Who would have ever thought up such a salvation? That gets us to our text tonight in chapter 11. So that was just a little bit of an opening. Sorry, I went a little long. Let's uh, pray and we'll jump into our text for today. Lord, we give you thanks for uh, this time that we can spend in your word. Help us uh, to really stand in awe like Paul did when he thinks about all that you've done to bring us to yourself. We pray that if there's any watching tonight or in the future, you would draw them savingly to yourself, that they would see their need, that they recognize they're under your wrath and they're an enemy, unless they're reconciled through the death of the Lord Jesus, and they can find in him a righteousness that they can never attain any other way. Pray that we would be stunned like the Apostle Paul was when he penned these words. In Christ's name, amen. Take a look at now, we come to a, what's called a doxology, and it's really just a, a praise of what we've just kind of rehearsed and looked at. Verse 33, you, ought, you really ought to feel these verses more than anything. I, I would rather, be, because if you've been tracking with us through Romans, and it, well, especially what we've been looking at last, what, few weeks. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. Let that sink in. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. Why, what is that in reference to? All Israel being saved at the second coming of Christ and Gentiles being grafted into the tree. Yeah, keep going. <clears throat> Everything that we have seen about salvation to bring God bringing us to himself, whether Jew or Gentile. Oh, the depths and the riches. Both thinking, like who, who would have thought up such a plan? So he does this in 1 Corinthians also. God's wisdom seems foolish to man, but when you have the Spirit within you and you can step back and see how God's worked through history and see what he's doing to save you, to bring you to yourself, and the Spirit has opened up your eyes to boast in the cross and to boast in Jesus and his atoning work, you, you will be like Paul. And think about Paul. He hated Christians. He hated Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. He held the coat while people stoned a Christian to death, Acts chapter 8. And then Paul, I don't he never got over grace. By the grace of God, I am what I am, he says in 1 Corinthians 15, chapter, uh, Galatians 1. You guys, I don't know if you're there yet, but he talks about his testimony, how God was pleased to reveal the Lord Jesus to him. He never got over grace. Here I was, a Christ killer. I killed Christians. 
I was involved in that. I hated Jesus. I wanted to snuff out that movement. And then God's grace radically saves him. And now he's boasting in the cross. In Galatians, when you get, uh, he says, may I never boast. And he even uses some interesting words in Galatians. So if you're in Romans, just turn over past First and Second Corinthians. Chapter 6, verse 14. May I never be that I would boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Or Galatians 2.20, 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith, by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Never got over the cross, recognized that Jesus gave his life for him. In chapter 1 of Galatians, he talked about his former manner of life, how he persecuted the church of God, tried to destroy it, chapter 1, verse 13. He tried to destroy the church of God. But God called him through his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in him so that he might preach him among the nations. I don't think Paul ever got over grace. So as we come to Romans 11, you've got to feel in your soul the weight of the, this is praise, isn't it? Culminating in praise. What did God do to bring you to saving faith? You were dead in sins. This idea that God has shut up. He's imprisoned all in disobedience. Jew, Gentiles, all, everybody of the nations... Ephesians 2, let's turn over there. We were sons of disobedience. And, and I remember in college, I had a professor, Dr. Morgan, said, I want to share with you some of the darkest verses in the New Testament in his view. Listen to Ephesians 2. And you are dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging in the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God being rich in what? Mercy. Mercy. Because of his great love with which he loved us, when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together raised us up, seated us with Christ in the heavenly places. What are the darkest verses, according to Morgan, back in maybe 1997 when I sat in one of his classes? Here it is. Chapter 2, verse 11. Remember, you Gentiles, who are called the uncircumcised by the circumcision, by the Jewish people. Remember, verse 12, look at verse 12. Remember that you were at, at that time separated from, separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who are formerly far, far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Jesus, he's our peace. He, he put the two groups and made them into one. Great section. We could keep reading because it, it is really awesome. Same doxology, so look at chapter 3. To me, the least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the nations the unfathomable riches of Christ. I get the privilege of preaching the unfathomable riches of Christ. You who had no hope, you were without God in the world, what did he do? You were sons of disobedience, and he's made you alive in You've been your sins have been atoned for. Now look at chapter three. He's praying this, praying. I bow my knees before the Father. Chapter three, verse fourteen, that He would grant you, according to the riches of His glory, to be strengthened with power through His Spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may here it is, verse eighteen, 
may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, the length, the height, the depth, and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge. What's he saying there? I think it's another doxology. I pray that you would be able to really understand, comprehend the breadth, the length, the height, the depth. In chapter 1, he prays that God would do that. Chapter uh, Ephesians chapter 1. I pray that your eyes might be enlightened so that you may know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches, here it is again, the riches of glory of his inheritance in the saints. And what is the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who believe? I, I think you see these doxologies everywhere, the riches of what Christ is, has done. What If we really had this type of thing where we really understand justification, the atonement of Christ, his love and all that, it would cause us to break out in what? Praise. Praise. Like, stand in awe. And we ought to pray that. We ought to pray that our, our eyes would grasp that. So, Romans 11, let's... Finish Romans 11 up tonight. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable, untraceable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. What do you say to that? Amen. What do you think he's trying to say there in verse 33? The depth of the riches of God's wisdom. In the Old Testament, like in Psalm 104, 24, he talks about when he looks out at all the creation and all the creatures, he says, God made them in wisdom. The world is full of the wisdom of God in designing these crazy creatures and a beautiful galaxy and the stars and the sun and the moon and all these things. Does creation sing praises to the wisdom of God? However, I don't think that's what he's talking about in Romans 11. So in Psalm 104, 24, he does. There are a lot of Psalms that talk about standing in awe. And in the book of Isaiah, standing in awe of God because he's the creator. 104, 24. Do you have it, Pam? Mm -hmm. Oh, Lord, how many are your works and wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your possessions. So we could look out of creation, the beauty of the flowers coming up, everything turning green, right? Bugs, bees, butterflies, robins eating earthworms, hummingbirds flying around, all speaking of the glory of God. You know, remember the uh, Isaiah 6 where the whole earth is full of his glory? Here, the psalmist is saying, how many are your works and wisdom? You've made them all. The earth is, the earth is full of your uh, possessions. So... We ought to be standing in awe of God's wisdom just by looking around us. However, I think the, the idea of praise in verse 33 is in light of everything that we've been learning in Romans. This, the atoning work of Christ to save Jews and Gentiles. And right now there's a partial hardening until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. And then God's going to save all of Israel, and, and in my opinion, at the coming of Christ. No wonder Paul says, Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. For, verse 34, For who has known the mind of the Lord or who became his counselor? Do you have a cross-reference to any of those? Isaiah 40. 13. Okay, so let's look at verse 34 and 35, and then we'll go there. Because now he's he's talking about God's wisdom and how unsearchable are his ways and how unfathomable, you know, it's just beyond tracing out, fully comprehending. And see, then he quotes from Isaiah 40, verse 13. You want to look that up and read it, Pam? Well, uh, actually, we're going to look at a few verses in Isaiah 40 there. 
who has directed the spirit of the Lord or as his counselor has informed him. So chapter 40, I love 40 through 48. It's all about how glorious God is. If you take a look at this verse, it's, it's right in the context of God's glory being revealed and how all men are like grass and their glory is like the flower of the field. That's verse six and seven. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of God stands forever. So as you keep reading down through here, Pam just read verse 13, verse 12. So skip up and go. So sometimes just go back and look at what is the context of this verse that he's quoting. Who's measured the waters in the hollow of his hands, marked off the heavens by the span? The answer is no one. Calculated the dust of the earth by measure? No one. Right? Only God. Right? With So, with whom did he consult? Who gave God understanding? Who taught him the path of justice and knowledge? I mean, if you just keep reading... Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket, regarded as a speck of dust on the scales. Verse 18, to whom then will you liken God? What likeness will you compare him? And then he mocks the idols. People make these idols and they got to nail them down so they don't teeter-totter. Verse 21, do you not know, have you not heard, has it not been declared to you from the beginning, have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sets above the circle of the earth. It, it, the inhabitants are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens. And it's just a litany of praise to God. He, he knows all the stars, names them. He's the creator of all these things. The everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth, verse 28. Chapter 40, all the way through 48, speak of the majesty of God, and this God also has mercy. Why does does Israel have an opportunity? Why could their future still be bright? Because of God's mercy. That's the context here in Isaiah. The greatness of God is the same God who can pour out riches of mercy. What's the context of Romans 11? It's a context of mercy. Look at verse 30. For just as you once were disobedient to God, but now have been shown mercy. Mercy. So these also have been disobedient. That because of the mercy shown to you, that they may now be shown what? Mercy. For God has shut up all in disobedience. Chapter 3, verse 9. So that he might show mercy to all. Now the context, verse 33. Oh, the riches of both the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments, unfathomable his ways. Now he quotes from Isaiah 40, verse 13. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has become his counselor? Why does he bring that up? Well, who's going to give God any advice? How, How silly is that? Yeah, the problem is, do we ever think that? Are his judgments way beyond our comprehension? Are his ways higher than our ways? Definitely. Why is it good to feel that bigness of God? So that we realize how menial we are in comparison. And think about this. Doesn't it fill our hearts and souls to say, I know God, the God who created the world, the God who shows mercy? Does that excite you at all? Mm -hmm. Like, I I know God in a real and saving way. I get to worship. I get to know and love. To have a high view of God is good for your soul. It's a must. And to see the tenderness and the mercy and the love of God displayed in the cross, that's a must. And when you put those two together... You ought to be like Paul and like want to worship like, oh, this is, this is way deep, way beyond me. I can't even search it out. It is like stunning. 
Then he quotes uh, from another verse in the Old Testament. Who has first given to him that what? That it might be paid back to him again. Where's he quoting now from? Job. Job. So if you go away over to Job and you kind of look at, you know, look around for the context. Job 35, 7, right? Uh, 41, 11 first. I thought 41, 11 fit the context better. So this is God sitting Job down, asking him all these questions. Basically, Job, if you don't understand all these questions, how do you think? I mean, if I wanted to reveal to you the secret knowledge of what's going on, could you really comprehend it? And Job's like, no, I put my hand over my mouth. I repent in dust and ashes. I, I, I spoke out of turn. So, verse 11. Who was given to me that I should repay him? <laughs> Who's ever given to God that he needs to repay somebody? So he pulls this quote out, out of all of Job, he pulls this quote out of Job 41, verse 11. Can anybody fish out Leviathan with a fish hook? This great creature of the deep, who's majestic. Who can fish him out? Well, God can. Nobody else can, right? He's uh, horrifying. The, the, the point of the chapter is God can. And who has ever given to God that God would have to repay him? Do people have a low view of God? Like, oh, poor pitiful God. You know? Like, I wish I could be his counselor. Terrible thinking. So, this is an exalted view of God. As Paul looks at everything... Election, depravity, the fall, redemption, what he's doing with Israel and the nations. It's unsearchable. Unfathomable are his ways. How deep does it go? Our fishing, did your dad, you guys really didn't have a fishing boat, did you? Have you ever been on a boat, though, with, with a fish finder? Remember my dad had a little boat that had the fish finder? Mm -hmm. when, you're, when you're in the boat, and you see these fish, it will tell you how deep the bottom is. Imagine being out on a ship and like, like we, we, we can't plummet the depths of this lake or this ocean. It's like unfathomable. That, that's the language here. How unfathomable his ways. And so he quotes from Isaiah and he quotes from Job. Who is, who is first given to him that it might be paid back? No, not at all. Because why? Here it is, verse 36. Why? For from him and through him and to him are all things. All these little prepositions. From. From. From him and through him and to him. He's the source. He's the reason. He's the goal. We, we're here because of him. Everything that we have in the world, every good meal, every good birth, every good relationship, every sunny, beautiful day, everything good comes from God. He's created the whole world. For from him and through him and to him are all things, though. Everything owes its existence to God. And, and so he really, right here is the pinnacle of it all. For who's known the mind of the Lord? Who's, so he, he's standing in awe here, and then he closes with verse 36. For from him, from God, and through him, and to him. What do you what do you think it means and to him? He's he's all the things. goal, mm -hmm. right? Are all things to him be the glory forever. Amen. This is God's universe. 
How many people live their life, according to Romans 1, in God's world and never give him thanks or proper worship and say, I want to know that God? That shows how, how spiritually dead we are, right? Yeah, I could care less. You owe your existence to God, and you're saying I could care less. Go out and talk to people, and you'll find people like this. They're all over the place. Yeah, I could care less. Is there a guy? I don't know, and I really don't care. That's how I lived for 24 years. It's frightening to think about. Frightening. And then you receive mercy through the death of the Lord Jesus. That's even more worship. And when, when this really gets down in you, it's like, there's nothing better, is there? No. Is there any experience that can equal grasping just a little bit of what God has done? That's why I do Bible studies. That's why we're in the Bible, is, is to light, to be used of the Lord, to create affection for the things of God. Uh, because this life is so short, isn't it? Just went to a funeral of a dear friend, 84 years of age. Pam and I, he, he was a member of our first church that we that I pastored. Lovely guy. Just the peace of Christ ruled in his life. They were an encouragement. They sat in the same place every Sunday. It's a gift of God. God puts us in the body of Christ, transforms, saves us from all these different backgrounds. Save Pam at age eight. Save me at 24. I hope you know his mercy and that you can praise him like Paul does here and other places. And to really meditate on verse 36, from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The same thing is said of Jesus from him and through him. This, is, this can be said of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, John 1, 3, all things, there's nothing that exists that didn't come through, John says, Jesus. Colossians 1, 15 and 16. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, chapter 2, verse 10, etc. cetera, right? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm preaching on Hebrews uh, 13, 20 on uh, Easter, and I just, I read it Sunday. Let me just read it again. Now, to the God of peace who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, equip you in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight. Here it is. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. You could go through the New Testament. All things are through the Father. All things are through the Son. All things are through the Spirit. So when I worship God, when I say that I'm worshiping, worshiping Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, for the work of redemption is a triune uh, redemption, is it not? Mm -hmm. Ephesians yeah. talks about our triune redemption, Father, Son, and Spirit. So anyway, hope, hope my prayer tonight was, was going to be just, I hope it stirs within you just worship. Because that... Out of our study up until Romans 11, that's what it should be doing. Chapter 12 and following is very hands-on, if you will. Um, he's going to tell us how to live with other people. <laughs> um, how to serve other people. How to love other people. How to be devoted to one another. Uh, chapter 12, verse 10. Be of the same mind toward one another, Jew and Gentile. Don't be haughty in mind. Associate with the lowly. Don't be wise in your own estimation. How can he say all these things now in chapters 12, 13, 14, and 15? Because he's already laid the groundwork. Be of the same mind toward one another. He's already built that foundation. Right? That's where we're headed next week. Chapter 12. If you want to read ahead... I'm sorry I kind of flew through things tonight, but I kind of wanted to do that because I that's I think that what's that's what Paul's doing and at the end of chapter eleven here, before he gets into 
Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies, plural, as a living sacrifice. Before we get to duty, before we get to what we ought to be doing, we already see what God has done to bring us to ourselves, uh, to himself, which should result in praise. So, um, I'm glad, uh, thank you, Catherine, for saying, wow, um, that's what we should say. We, we should tomorrow say, wow, I'm a Christian. I know God. Pam's making me get a physical soon. So she called and made, made an appointment. Well, let's say if I find out, what if I had cancer? On the one hand, I'm going to be sad because I love being here. Love being a husband. Love being a grandfather. Love being a pastor. But I want to be like Paul. You know, I want to stay for your joy and progress in the faith. But man, to depart me with Christ is what? Very much better. I mean, we're in a win-win situation. Jesus prayed for us, John 17, 24. Father, my prayer is that all those that you have given me would be with me where I am and see my what? Glory. So Dick Downing, who passed away, the moment he died, saw the glory of Christ. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. You're going to die. I'm going to die. But what a this short time that we live here on earth, let's continue to know more about what God has done. So... Went a little long tonight. Apologize for that, I guess. Do I? Why do I apologize? I'm really not sorry that we went over. Because you could just click off if you need if you need to go do something. So thanks for being on. Let's close in prayer, shall we? Lord, thank you that we get to talk about your word and what you've done. You're, you're an amazing God who loves us more than we could ever come to know. Your mercy is great. Your love is great. May we be in awe of what you have done. Pray that we uh, could experience this doxology like Paul did. To you be the glory. In Christ's name, amen. All right, we'll see you next week. Lord bless.